Welcome back to Bombastic Nation, a ting, a ting, a ting. I'm the giant, I'm Mr. Giant. <laughs> and I'm back with some more vibes for all. You know, we're in the last uh, part of the Napoleon's Marshall series. Berthier, Lannis, and Devault. I hope I pronounce it right. But those are the last three we're gonna talk about and they call them the top three. So we're gonna see what's going on. You understand what I mean? I'm gonna leave a link in the description to this video so you can go check it out. And check out the channel too. The channel is bomb, you know what I mean? Also, if you subscribe and you're not getting notifications because some people say they haven't been, hit that notification bell so you're gonna know when I'm putting out videos. And uh, if you ain't subscribed, subscribe. Let's build a family and thing, you know what I mean? And uh, let's go ahead and YouTube with Sib Sibber and see what this is all about. Yeah, let's see what the top three is about. Terror Belly Decus Pacis. Terror in war, ornament in peace. The words inscribed on every French marshal's baton. In France, the title of Marshal, or Maréchal, Maréchal. at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a Marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. This is Epic History TV's guide to Napoleon's Marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as Marshals. With expert guidance from... She I go with personality more than I go with achievements. Chief historian of That's the my problem, I guess. So far, we've met Marshals Perignon, Brune, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jourdan, Bernadotte, Augereau, Lefebvre, Mortier, Marmont, Saint-Cyr, Oudineau, Victor, Murat, Bessier, MacDonald, Massena, Suchet, Ney, and Soult. We're delighted to welcome back as our video sponsor, NapoleonSouvenirs.com. The online shop for fans of the Napoleonic era. Since 2010, the team at NapoleonSouvenirs.com has offered the finest quality gifts and souvenirs for all those who adore the Napoleonic era. Their extraordinary range of gifts includes busts and statuettes of the Emperor himself, Napoleon-themed champagne, and stunning replicas of... I'll have to try that Napoleon-themed champagne. <laughs> Flags of the Grand Armée and Imperial Guard, and even the baton of a Maréchal. You can visit their online store at Napoleon Souvenirs. I'd like to have one of them baton. If you're lucky enough to be in Paris, visit the Boutique Napoleon in person. Vive l'Empereur, and thank you to NapoleonSouvenirs.com for sponsoring this video. Three. Marshal Berthier. No one else could replace him. Oh, simple but to the Louis point. Alexandre Berthier was born at Versailles, 10 miles from Paris. His mother served at the palace as a chambermaid to the future Louis XVIII. His father was a colonel in the topographical engineers, a specialist corps of military surveyors. Berthier followed in his father's footsteps, joining the topographical engineers aged just 13 was commissioned lieutenant at 17. Wow. He proved a talented and diligent staff officer. Ten years later, he accompanied General Rochambeau to America as part of French support to the colonists in their War of Independence and witnessed the British defeat at Yorktown. By the time the French Revolutionary Wars broke out, Bertier was a... Intertwined there, isn't it? That's kind of cool. Service. Studied and you wouldn't think that the there was that uh, organization and command. intertwined living there. The reputation for outstanding staff work meant his services were in high demand, and he served as chief of staff to Rochambeau, Lafayette, and Luckner. But during the terror, 
Ties to these politically suspect generals put Berthier himself under the spotlight. He was stripped of his rank and not officially reinstated until 1795, when he became chief of staff of the Army of Italy. A chief of staff led the staff section, which was responsible for turning the general's orders into action by drafting written instructions which were sent out by courier, as well as every aspect of army administration, ensuring efficient movement and supply, and collating reports on the enemy, terrain, roads, and anything else that might affect operations. Berthier, building on recent trends in French staff practice, now developed his own comprehensive staff organization. He established three sections, his personal office or cabinet, mostly skilled civilian clerks who handled troop movements, transcribed orders, filed reports, and collated intelligence on enemy forces. His private military staff, made up of aides-de-camp, liaison officers, and couriers. And the general staff itself, headed by the first assistant major general, also divided into three sections. The first dealt with additional troop movements, plus auxiliary Man, services, he had a lot of responsibilities. Hospitals, military policing, prisoners of war, and security of supply lines. The second section organized the army's camps and billets. The third section was the topographical section, responsible for maps and reconnaissance. The general structure of Berthier's system changed little over the next 18 years and proved uniquely effective at handling the challenges posed by a new era of European warfare. Its chief beneficiary would be the Army of Italy's new commander, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon also discovered that his chief of staff possessed immense personal qualities, a heroic capacity for work, meticulous memory and attention to detail, and devotion to duty and discipline. Crucially, he had a gift for turning Napoleon's verbal, sometimes vague, commandments into clear, concise written orders that made sense to his officers and later marshals. Napoleon and Berthier established a highly effective working relationship that would last until 1814. It relied on Berthier's complete acceptance of his subordinate role. He played no part in devising strategy and never challenged or contradicted Napoleon except on points of logistical detail. When a friend queried his devotion to Napoleon, who was an extremely demanding and short-tempered boss, Berthier replied, Remember that one day it will be a fine thing to be second to Bonaparte. Berthier's hard work and brilliant staff system underpinned all Napoleon's successes in Italy and beyond. They spent so much time together, Berthier was nicknamed Napoleon's wife. He was personally brave too, leading an attack at Lodi and a cavalry charge at Rivoli. But his genius was for staff work and administration, not army command, as he well knew. When he briefly inherited command of the Army of Italy in 1797, he begged Napoleon to return as soon as possible to take over. Berthier played a crucial role in planning Napoleon's Egyptian expedition of 1798 yeah. and masterminded his famous crossing of the Alps in 1800, which saw French troops advance almost a hundred miles through the mountains in just eight days. The same year, Napoleon made Berthier Minister of War, putting him in charge of all French military administration. When Napoleon proclaimed his new empire in 1804, Berthier was the first name on the list of new marshals, with seniority over all others. The next year, his role as Chief of Staff, or Major General of the Grand Armée, was officially confirmed. In the fast-moving campaign of 1805, Berthier's system ensured Napoleon always had up-to-date information about the location and strength of his own forces, as well as the latest reports on enemy movements from scouts, spies, and prisoners. Such advantages helped him achieve the stunning encirclement of Max Austrian army at Ulm. On campaign, Berthier and the Emperor often traveled together in the Imperial coach, working without pause. 
His workload was immense. At but sea. So too were the rewards. Following the victory at Austerlitz, Napoleon made Berthier the hereditary sovereign prince of Neuchâtel and Valangean with an enormous private income. Over the course of Napoleon's reign, he received endowments worth more than a million francs per year from the emperor, more than any other marshal. Yet Berthier remained a liability as a field commander. In 1809, Napoleon put him in temporary command of the army of Germany. When Archduke Charles made a bold advance into Bavaria, Berthier's response was hesitant and muddled, and nearly led to Marshal Davout's corps being encircled. Only Napoleon's arrival averted disaster. Returning to his usual role as Chief of Staff, Berthier once more proved his exceptional talents, coordinating the movement of 200,000 men and paving the way for the Emperor's victory at Wagram. The title, Prince of Wagram, was at... You know, if you know the man isn't a very good war general, but good in administration, why do you keep putting him uh, to lead stuff? Were they short of men? Was he the only one available? You know what I mean? But it's kind of a interesting that he could implement all these things but can't physically lead it. That's interesting. Added to his honors. The invasion of Russia in 1812 was a test like no other for Marshal Berthier and his staff. It required coordinating the movement of half a million troops the biggest army ever seen in Europe, across a 400-mile front. A simple private is happier than I, Berthier complained. I am being killed by all this work. It's got a heavy load. It was clear the Grand Armée's supply lines were at breaking point, and Berthier was among those who tried to persuade Napoleon to halt the advance at Smolensk. He was ignored. As disaster engulfed the army, Berthier continued to perform his duty. By the end of the retreat, he was marching on foot with frostbitten fingers. When Napoleon left the army to return to Paris without him, he wept openly. Despite his own poor health in the wake of the retreat, Berthier worked hard to salvage the remnants of the army and served throughout the campaign in Germany in 1813. By now, Napoleon's enemies had reformed their own army general staffs, partly inspired by Berthier's example. But neither Berthier nor his system was perfect. In May, a confusing order to Marshal Ney contributed to his late arrival at the Battle of Bautzen, and a missed chance to crush the coalition army. Berthier was also notorious for his jealousies and grudges. His pedantic vendetta against Jomini, Ney's talented chief of staff, drove him to defect to the Russians. Berthier must also bear some blame for the disastrous end to the Battle of Leipzig. He knew there weren't enough bridges for the army to retreat safely, but failed to press the matter with Napoleon. When the only bridge in the city was blown too early, 30,000 men became prisoners. Berthier continued to serve Napoleon faithfully through the desperate defense of France until the Emperor's abdication in April 1814. The restored Bourbon monarchy showered titles and honors on Berthier. The king even gave him an honorary rank in his own guard. Napoleon's return from exile 11 months later put him in an impossible situation, torn both ways by his sense of duty and loyalty. It seems like a lot of the, the, the marshals and a lot of the people just went on over to the other side when Napoleon was uh, exiled. And then he shows up again and everybody is confused. They don't know what to do. Well, that's just crazy. He Can you imagine? The king on his flight to the Netherlands, but was treated with such suspicion by the royal court that he left for his wife's family estate in Bavaria. There, a few weeks later, Berthier fell from a window and was killed. It was most likely a simple accident, 
though some believe he killed himself out of guilt or despair, or, less plausibly, was murdered by French royalist agents. Oh, Napoleon had expected Berthier conspiracy to theories. Him in 1815 and was scathing of his absence. I have been betrayed by Berthier, who was just a gosling transformed by me into some kind of eagle. But after his defeat at Waterloo, in which mismanaged staff work played an important role, Napoleon conceded, if Berthier had been there, I would not have met this misfortune. My man knows when to uh, had none of Murat's admit him, uh, Monet's heroism, missteps, tactical instincts of Davou, but he was the indispensable marshal, whose brilliant administration and tireless work were the foundation for so much of Napoleon's military success. Two, Marshal Lannes. He has truly become a superior being by the time he perished. I found him a pigeony, but I lost a giant. Let's see what the vibe is here with Lowndes. Jean Lan was a farmer's son from Gascony, who quit his job as a dyer's apprentice to join the local volunteer battalion in 1792. Energetic and charismatic, he was immediately elected to be an officer by his comrades. The unit was sent to fight the Spanish on the Eastern Pyrenees front, where Lan proved a brave and active officer. He distinguished himself in several actions and was promoted to command the regiment. Lan was then transferred to Italy as part of General Augereau's division where his bold, aggressive leadership won praise from General Massena and then at Dago from General Bonaparte himself, who rewarded Lan with command of a grenadier brigade in the army's advance guard. A month later, at the Battle of Lodi, Colonel Lan was first across the river, leaping off the bridge, wading ashore under enemy fire. At the Battle of Arcole, he was wounded twice, but when he heard the French were retreating, he left the dressing station to lead a fresh attack, which probably saved Napoleon from capture or worse. Napoleon later presented the flag he waved at the battle to Lan, and a special bond was formed between them, based on mutual respect and loyalty. Lan was promoted to Brigadier General, and in 1798 joined Napoleon's expedition to Egypt. He played a prominent role in the campaign, helping to suppress the revolt in Cairo and leading the assaults on Jaffa and Acre, where he was shot in the neck and only saved from certain death by his men, who carried him back to safety. At the Battle of Abu Kir, Lan's infantry worked with Murad's cavalry to inflict a crushing defeat on the Ottoman army. While recovering from his latest wounds in this battle, Lan received painful news from home. His wife had given birth to another man's child. Whoa! He returned to France with Napoleon in October and divorced his wife not long after. You know, when Napoleon's. Not him in specifically. And I take back my reaction to going, whoa, his wife had a, a child with another man. What do you expect? You gone for months and years at a time? What are you going to do? Put on a chastity belt? And this kind of stuff happens throughout man's history, you take it, you know what I mean? The, di <laughs> the difference between men and women is they could, women could keep a secret. They, if, especially if it pertains to them. No, some friends might know, but usually they keep that stuff to themselves. You know, a dude will do stuff and go to, yeah, I'm a man, I can do this and act like an idiot. But a woman will keep nice and quiet. And I'm, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm, I'm versed on women's mentality. It's just. Let's just say experience. See, I'm 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 a good guy, so you know 
women tell me things. Uh -huh. Because they think I'm one of the girls since I'm uh, harmless, you know, I don't try to do to them what other men want to do to them. So they tell me things and yeah, they know how to keep a secret. And you know, I, I ain't gonna tell them man if I know him. <laughs> <laughs> must be bad of me. I'm making light of the situation. But the point is, you know, I, I shouldn't sit here and go, whoa, she did that to him. That's evil. Because who knows what he's doing while he's out on the front lines. He's, you know what I mean? Or, or, or like when there's a lull and they go into the town and action and back and all going on and thing. Who knows what he's doing? That would be very egotistical of me to go, oh, she's a bad one. While we know, you know what I mean? Staged his coup of 18 Brumaire, Lan helped to ensure the army's loyalty. The next spring, Napoleon's army marched over the Alps into Italy. Lan's vanguard led the way, and at Montebello encountered an Austrian force that outnumbered it two to one. Lan was able to win a brilliant victory thanks to crucial support from General Victor. Just five days later, his division played a key role in Napoleon's great victory at Marengo. Lan never forgot a favor. He and Victor remained firm friends. But he also never forgot a grudge, was notoriously short-fused and quick to perceive an insult. In 1800, Lan remarried to Louise Antoinette Guernouc, daughter of a senator, with whom he'd have five children. He was also appointed commander of Napoleon's consular guard, but he was dismissed after General Bessières helped expose his mismanagement of the budget, for which Lan never forgave him. In semi-disgrace, Lan was sent as ambassador to Portugal, a short, eventful spell in which, against expectation, his soldierly manner won over Portugal's prince regent. By 1804, it was clear that all was forgiven. Lan received news that he'd been made a marshal of the new French Empire and orders to return to Paris for Napoleon's coronation. The following year, he took command of 5th Corps of the Grande Armée, forming the vanguard for the advance against the Austrian army in Bavaria. Lan had to work closely with Marshal Murat, a bitter rival since a falling out in Egypt, but they put their differences aside. Together, they bluffed an Austrian commander into surrendering a vital Danube bridge by persuading him that an armistice had been signed. At one point, Lan even snatched the fuse from the soldier's hand as he prepared to light the explosive charges. The day before the Battle of Austerlitz, Lan's quick temper got the better of him. He demanded to fight a duel with Marshal Soult, who in his eyes had made him look foolish in front of the Emperor. Soult ignored the challenge. In the battle that followed, Lan's V Corps I challenge you to a duel against Bagration's attacks, later pushing forward with the cavalry to help take 7,000 Russian prisoners. After the battle, Lan was infuriated that Soult, and not he, was singled out for praise by the Emperor. Within days, Lan had resigned his command and returned to France. In 1806, with tempers cooled, Napoleon summoned Lan to rejoin the army for the war with Prussia. Back in command of V Corps, Lan was as active, aggressive and brilliant as ever. At Saalfeld, he fought the first major combat of the war, routing a Prussian division commanded by Prince Luke. So let me get this straight. They could just say, I don't want to do this anymore. I quit and go home. I thought in the army, you know, you sign a certain amount of time and you have to stay there until the end regardless. And then maybe back then it wasn't like that, but just to say, man, you screwed me over. Adios. That's interesting. Louis Ferdinand. Four days later, at Jena, Lan opened the main French attack at Dol, with General Suchet's division in the lead. For six hours, his troops were engaged in furious fighting for the villages on the plateau. Until finally, the Prussian resistance was broken. By December, the war had moved into Poland. Lan attacked a larger Russian force at Bultusk, 
but it was a bloody, indecisive affair. Wounds and fever then forced him to convalesce in Warsaw, and so missed the Battle of Halau. That spring, Lann resumed command of the advance guard, as Napoleon sought out Bennigsen's Russian army, hoping to force a decisive battle. When Bennigsen located Lann's apparently isolated corps near Friedland, he attacked. He expected an easy victory, but Lann, with support from future marshals Udino and Grouchy, expertly used his troops to fend off the Russians, while Napoleon raced to join him with the main army. Lann's delaying tactics allowed Napoleon to catch the Russian army with its back to the river, and inflict a crushing defeat. The following year, Lann was ennobled as Duke of Montebello, and joined Napoleon for the invasion of Spain, despite suffering a serious riding injury en route. Taking command of Marshal Monse's Third Corps, Lann routed a Spanish army at the Battle of Tudela, sending the enemy fleeing in two directions. He was then given command of the Siege of Saragossa. Spanish soldiers and civilians defended the city with legendary courage, but Land's leadership and methodical house-by-house -house approach ensured ultimate victory at a high price. Even Land was left shaken by the savagery of the fighting, writing to Napoleon, Sire, this is a horrifying war. Napoleon recalled Land for the war with Austria in 1809. His provisional corps formed the vanguard for Napoleon's four-day campaign, a series of quick victories over the Austrians that culminated in the Battle of Egmont. Napoleon next needed Regensburg taken quickly. The Battle so of this, the Battle of that. To they took out the battle now, it's just a uh, desert storm. You know, they just give it names. Furious, not the battle of. He picked up a scaling ladder and shouted, I'll show you that before I was a marshal, I was a grenadier, and still am. As he rushed forward, his aides grabbed the ladder from him, reorganized the men, and led a successful attack. After occupying Vienna, Napoleon ordered his army to cross the Danube in pursuit of the Austrians. Marshals Lann and Massena led the way across improvised bridges, supported by Marshal Bessières' cavalry. It was soon clear that Napoleon had miscalculated and that they faced not just an Austrian rearguard, but the full might of Archduke Charles' army. Massena held the village of Aspern, while Lann organized the defense of Essling. The desperately needed reinforcements and ammunition were held up as the Austrians floated obstacles downriver to smash the fragile bridges. Land's old rival, Marshal Bessier, was placed under his temporary command. Land sent repeated orders for him to charge the enemy, in language that verged on an accusation of cowardice. Wow! The two marshals nearly came to blows. The next day, Land's corps led an attack on the Austrian centre but was driven back by the weight of enemy fire. The French-held villages were under constant, pulverizing bombardment. Around 4 p.m., Lannes' old friend, General Pouzet, was hit by a cannonball and killed in front of him. Lann, badly shaken, walked off to sit alone for a moment, when a cannonball skipped along the ground and smashed both his legs. Lann was carried to the rear, and placed in the care of the Grande Armée's most famous surgeon, Baron Larray. Larray quickly decided that he must amputate one leg. The operation went well, but the wound became infected, and Lann died nine days later. Napoleon, who had visited Lann every day, wept at news of his death. What a loss for France, and for me. Then he wrote to Land's wife. The Marshal has died this morning of the wounds he received on the field of honor. My pain equals yours. I lost the most distinguished general in my army and a companion in arms for 16 years, whom I considered my best friend. 
Marshal Lannes' death was a great blow to Napoleon and the army. He had proved himself an outstanding commander. As brave as Ney, with the military mind of Soult, the Marshal who led Napoleon's vanguard in four of his greatest campaigns. His remarkable soldiering skills would be sorely missed by the Emperor in the challenging years that lay ahead. One, Marshal Davout. Davout! Davout was one of the purest glories. Let me well, go back, back here, man. Why did they miss that? Marshal Davout. The purest glories of France. Okay. Okay. Louis Let's hear Davout was born into a noble family from Burgundy. Noble. With the tradition of military service that went back to the Crusades. At 15, he was sent to the military school in Paris, just missing a young Napoleon Bonaparte, who'd graduated a few weeks before. In 1788, Davout was commissioned into the Royal Champagne Cavalry Regiment. But within a year, his vocal support for the French Revolution had got him into deep trouble. He was forced to resign his commission and spend six weeks in prison. In 1791, Davout joined a local volunteer battalion and was elected its deputy commander. The next year, France was at war with Austria and Prussia and Davout soon proved himself a brave, highly organized and energetic officer. He also won praise for attempting to prevent his commanding officer, General Dumouriez, defecting to the Austrians, though he was not successful. The incident did speed Davout's promotion to Brigadier General. But the revolution was now entering its most extreme phase. A new law barred ex-aristocrats from the army and Davout had to resign his commission once more. A year passed before he was reinstated, with command of a cavalry brigade in the army of the Moselle. He led a series of daring operations against the Austrians. Did they just say they banned rich people <laughs> or nobles from the army? Wow. In 1798, Desai introduced Davout to his friend, General Bonaparte. Napoleon was not at first impressed, Davout was aloof, untidy, and awkward. Napoleon even described him as a damn brute. But he did trust to say his judgment, and gave Davout a command in his army bound for Egypt. It was a tough campaign for Davout, who caught dysentery in Cairo. But he further demonstrated his military skill, winning a series of skirmishes on Dessay's expedition into Upper Egypt and later leading a successful assault on the town of Aboukir. Soon after their return to France, General Dessay was killed at the Battle of Marengo, robbing Davout of a close friend and patron. However, Napoleon had been won over by Davout's performance in Egypt. He now promoted him General of Division and appointed him Inspector General of Cavalry. Napoleon also encouraged Davout to marry Amy Leclerc, Pauline Bonaparte's sister-in-law, bringing Davout within the First Consul's extended family. It proved a loving... Well, he's... Uh, I think he's about to say it proved a loving, he said, you know, but... It was still political, it seems, you know. You marry her, you'll be in, bruh. <laughs> you marry her, you'll be in. He says it was a loving marriage. marriage. And a great source of strength to Davout in the years Good. ahead. Good, walked out. In 1803, Davout was given command of the camp of Bruges, where troops were preparing for the invasion of England. Here, he established his reputation as an exceptional administrator and hard taskmaster, enforcing discipline and regular training, while paying attention to his soldiers' welfare and sacking officers who didn't meet his high standards. In 1804, Napoleon proclaimed a new French empire, and Davout, aged 34, became the youngest of its new marshals. His inclusion was a surprise to many, especially as he'd still not commanded anything larger than a brigade in battle. It's very likely that the deaths of Davout's patron, Dessay, and brother-in-law, Leclerc, cleared a path for him. 
The next year, Davout's troops became 3rd Corps of the Grande Armée and marched east to take on the 3rd Coalition. On the eve of the Battle of Austerlitz, Davout force-marched his corps 70 miles in two days, arriving at dawn on Napoleon's right flank. His troops went straight into action, holding off a powerful coalition attack, buying time for Napoleon's decisive move against the enemy center. It was a remarkable performance by Third Corps, soon eclipsed by an even greater feat of arms the next year in the war against Prussia. As Napoleon concentrated his forces at Jena to attack what he believed was the main Prussian army, he ordered Davout's Third Corps and Bernadotte's First Corps to cut off their retreat. But 10 miles north of Napoleon, near Auerstedt, Davout ran straight into the main Prussian army. With no sign of support from Marshal Bernadotte's First Corps, Davout's 26,000 men faced odds of more than two to one. Davout's masterful handling of his troops enabled Third Corps to repel the Prussian onslaught. Then, his line stabilized, Davout went on the offensive and routed the enemy army. It was a stunning victory, won at a high price. One in four of Davout's men were either killed or wounded. Wow. When Napoleon heard the first report, he was incredulous. Your marshal must have been seeing double, he told his aide de camp, making a joke of Davout's spectacle wearing. When the report was confirmed, he sent a message back to Davout. Tell the marshal that he, his generals and his troops have gained everlasting claims on my gratitude. He later gave Third Corps the honor of being the first troops to enter Berlin. The next year, at Eilau, Davout's corps again played a pivotal role, trying to turn the Russian flank. When his men were driven back, Davout rallied them, shouting, The cowards will die in Siberia, the brave will die on the field of honor. This time, Third Corps could not break through but its tenacity helped persuade the Russians to retreat that night. Following the peace treaty of Tilsit, Davout became governor general of the new Duchy of Warsaw, where he oversaw the recruitment and training of Polish troops. In 1808, he was ennobled as Duke of Auerstedt. But for all his military prowess, Davout was not a popular figure. Notoriously tough, his troops respected rather than loved him while several marshals were irritated by his air of superiority and blunt manner. In 1809, with war looming with Austria, Davout rejoined Third Corps at Regensburg. When Archduke Charles advanced into Bavaria, the army's temporary commander, Marshal Berthier, nearly left Davout to be cut off. As soon as Napoleon arrived, he ordered Davout to withdraw. It was almost too late. But with immense skill, Davout and Third Corps were able to fight their way clear and rejoin the army. Davout played a major part in the counter-offensive that followed, known as the Four-Day Campaign, pinning Austrian forces at Egmund, until Napoleon arrived to deliver a decisive blow. A month later, at the Battle of Aspern, Davout and Third Corps never made it across the river. The Marshal's role was limited to trying to sort out the crisis at the bridges until the French were forced to withdraw. When the army crossed the Danube again six weeks later, Davout was in his usual post on the right wing. On the first day of the Battle of Wagram, the Emperor criticised Davout for his slow attack. But the Iron Marshal, as he was now known, was saving his men for what he knew lay ahead. The next day, Davout's troops fought off a major Austrian dawn assault, then launched their own attack, gradually driving in the enemy left flank, helping to make Austrian retreat inevitable. Davout and his corps had emerged from another major campaign as heroes. 
the great for Napoleon, bestowed on him a new title, Prince of Egmul. For a few years there was peace in Central Europe. Davout spent most of it in Hamburg, in his new role as Governor General of the Hanseatic cities, cracking down on corruption and illegal trade with Britain. In 1812, Napoleon entrusted him with the enormous task of organizing the Grande Armée for the invasion of Russia. Davout's first corps alone was 72,000 strong, as big as Napoleon's entire army at Austerlitz. When it crossed the Nyman River in June, its troops were so well turned out that one observer compared them to the Imperial Guard itself. Davout's giant corps was the spear tip of Napoleon's invasion. He mauled Bagration's second army at Saltanovka, but could not prevent its escape. Three weeks later, his troops were in the thick of the fighting at Smolensk. But Davout's lack of allies among the other marshals began to show. Many were keen to see him taken down a peg or two, including Napoleon's chief of staff, Marshal Berthier, and perhaps even the emperor himself. When Davout got into a row with Marshal Murat, whom he regarded as incompetent, Napoleon decided in Murat's favor giving him one of Davout's divisions. On the eve of the Battle of Borodino, the Emperor dismissed Davout's request to outflank the Russian defences. You are always for turning the enemy, he told him. It is too dangerous a movement. In the bloody battle that followed, Davout's corps led the frontal attack on the flesh earthworks. The Marshal himself was injured when his dying horse rolled over him but remained on the field directing the attack, which was, ultimately, successful. Six weeks later, the Grand Armée began its infamous retreat from Moscow. You know what's amazing about this? It's like, despite flack from other marshals, and even Napoleon himself, this man goes into battle and still performs. And it seems to be a, a theme to, for some of the marshals in here because there seemed to be all kind of jealousy and stuff going on in between them and all of that. Uh, is that what was driving them or they were <laughs> that good? You know what I'm saying? The remains of Davout's corps was ordered to form the rear guard, but he was criticized for moving too slowly. Near Vyazma, a gap opened up Russian General Miloradovich pounced. First Corps was routed and saved only by the quick intervention of Marshal Ney, Eugène, and Poniatowski. Ney's Corps took over as rearguard, but when he became cut off at Krasny, Davout was widely blamed for not turning back to rescue him, even though it would have been suicidal. The moment highlighted the gulf in charisma between a marshal like Ney, who was loved by the troops, and Davout, who was not. Davout began the 1813 campaign holding Dresden, but when Hamburg was raided by Russian Cossacks, Napoleon sent him north to organize the city's defense. Exactly why Napoleon kept his best marshal in Hamburg while a decisive campaign raged in Saxony continues to puzzle historians. Davout was a stern and effective governor of Hamburg, securing the Lower Elbe River and Napoleon's strategic northern flank. He organized a new 13th Corps and, following Napoleon's defeat at Leipzig, withstood a six-month siege. Davout only surrendered Hamburg in May 1814, after confirmation arrived of Napoleon's abdication. But what difference the Iron Marshal might have made at Bautzen, Denevitz, Leipzig, or Long remains a tantalizing what if. What if? Davout was not welcomed into the restored Bourbon regime like other marshals. His loyalty to Napoleon was despised by the ultra royalists. Instead, he was forced into retirement and put under police surveillance. Wow. When Napoleon returned to France in 1815, Davout and Lefebvre were the only marshals waiting to greet him at the Tuileries Palace. But once again, Napoleon gave Davout a role which, in hindsight, 
seems a disastrous waste of his ability. Davout was made Minister of War and Governor of Paris. Vital roles requiring a brilliant and loyal administrator. And Davout worked miracles to raise a new army for Napoleon's final campaign. But if Davout, not Grouchy, had commanded the Emperor's right wing in 1815, who knows what might have been. Who knows? Following the Emperor's defeat at Waterloo, Davout organized the defense of Paris and urged Napoleon to fight on. Later accepting that he must abdicate, Davout ensured Napoleon's safe passage to the coast and submitted to the Bourbons. The Royalists had promised Davout that his officers would not be prosecuted for their conduct. He was furious to discover these assurances would not be honored. He also testified on behalf of Marshal Ney, but could not save him from a firing squad. Davout was stripped of his rank and income, though they were restored two years later, thanks to the intercession of Marshal Macdonald. Davout shunned court, as he always had. His health was failing, and in 1821, the death of his eldest daughter left him grief-stricken. He died two years later of tuberculosis, aged 53. Davout, the youngest and least proven of Napoleon's marshals, proved the most capable of all. Cool under fire and a brilliant tactician, he was the ideal corps commander in battle. A superb administrator, he was a stern and loyal deputy for the Emperor in Poland and Germany. His main weakness was his severe and blunt manner, which won few friends and left some even wishing to see him fail. Not something they saw from the Iron Marshal very often. Yeah. So that concludes our ranking of Napoleon's Marshals. What, 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 what? dramatic lives that reflect the tumultuous number eight. age. Products of a military meritocracy forged in the French Revolution. Skills honed by two decades of war. Their fates entwined in the rise and fall of empires. History may never see such an extraordinary, diverse and colorful collection of military commanders again. Thank you to all the patrons. That was the final uh, uh, part of the Napoleon's Marshals. Man, thank you all for just suggesting this. I really enjoyed this vibe here. And uh, I'm sticking with McDonald. The other guys are impressive too. You know, what's most impressive or what's most impressionable about this is how when I. Uh, when Napoleon left or abdicated the first time, how many marshals went over to the royal family? And like they said, when he came back, only two showed up uh, to to support him. But I guess I guess people would go to where they think it would be best for them and their family. I guess you know the the the, the position that they take, the side that they take, but. Uh, they're right, though. I mean, these are the, the stories of these men were like riveting, man. You know, the the battles they fought, the uh, the things that they had to go through to maintain their their, their their leadership. You know, getting some of them getting demoted, getting called back, getting thrown out, getting called back. The the inner fighting. Can you imagine? That's just pure chaos in a decade of war and a decade of infighting and stuff like that. That's crazy. But anyway, man, y'all, thank you for watching this with me. Link in the description to the video. Check it out. Check out the channel. Great vibes up there. And in the meantime, y'all take care of each other, all right? Cool runnings.